Welcome to episode 25 of Edges and Sledges. I'm DJ based in London. It's just gone past midnight here. Um, my co-bloggers and co-podcasters, Varun, it's quite early for him in Singapore, and Ashwin, who's uh, just, uh, it's evening for him in Cincinnati. So welcome everyone to episode 25. We've made it to a quarter of a century without too much hassle. So we're looking to build on this solid start. We've got quite a lot to talk about this week. So We'd like to get straight into it. Obviously, the Southampton test got over on Sunday. Uh, we've all kind of recovered from that a little bit. For those of you who've been living in a hole, India lost the test and lost the series with it. So, guys, let's start right from the top. Did India get team selection right at Southampton? Ashwin, should Jadeja have played the test match? Should we have played two spinners? Or should we have, should we have played Jadeja instead of Ashwin if he was unfit? Yeah, I, I mean, this is the beauty of having a recorded podcast is I don't get, you guys can't refute the fact that I've been saying Jadeja should play since basically the beginning of the series, right? I think Moin Ali doing as well as he did showed, I mean, there were there were periods of time during which we were all watching it saying, oh man, just imagine the kind of damage Jadeja could, Jadeja could do on a pitch like this. So I 100% think Jadeja should have played. Look, we if you remember, we played Bhuvi in an ODI, I think it was in this series, in the ODI, in the final ODI, when he wasn't 100% fit. And we're paying the price for that a little bit. I don't think Ashwin is 100% fit. I think he's a world-class bowler who's gotten a proven record in India, in the rest of Asia, and has been reasonably solid outside of Asia as well. So I don't think he just had a bad outing. I think he should not have played. He was not at 100% fitness. Whether he was at 70 or 90 is hard to say. And I think it showed. I think Moin Ali picked up five, uh, the, that five-wicket haul, which was really the, the game-changing feat. Ended up with nine wickets in the match, which would have left Jadeja on the sidelines feeling like he could have made an impact. So I think India got team selection wrong on that one. I don't think they should have changed anybody else. But I think we fell a little bit short there. Varun, just, on, just staying with the Ravi Chandran Ashwin point, how much do you think that Ashwin needs Jadeja to pick up wickets? Because we saw that he really struggled as the lone spinner. Yes, there may have been an element of him being unfit. But do you think that he needs Jadeja at the other end? Because we've seen it throughout the home summer. That both of them have just been bowling teams out for fun. So, your thoughts on that? Yeah, they, they often say that bowlers hunt in pairs, right? And we know that even with Broad and Anderson. So, I think having Jadeja on the other end makes a huge difference to Ashwin. I, I think they're a great bowling pair. They attack when they're together. One person can contain, which means the other person can pick up the wicket. So, But I think it's a bit harsh to say he needs Jadeja. I think I was reading online as well. Somebody was saying, Ashwin has 300 test wickets. He is a world-class bowler. I think uh, my view on the selection piece is, it's a very tough one, right? We criticize Kohli for changing the team every time for 38 games. And the one time he doesn't change the team, rather than say this is how it should be done, uh, everyone's criticizing him again. So it's a tough call. But yes, I think India got the team selection wrong. My personal belief is I would have played Jadeja instead of uh, Pandya. And India should have recognized that the minute England announced their team, right, the night before, that this pitch is going to spin. So... I think the most disappointing, and my last point on this, the most disappointing thing for me was Ashwin's lack of ability to adapt to the situation. It was amazing watching him bowl and the number of variations he had and the speed at which he was bowling. When you could clearly tell that everyone watching was saying, bowl a little slower and just aim for the rough and let the ball do its work. But it was amazing that he, he just didn't want to do that. It almost looked like a stubborn child saying, no, I will not do that. I'm better than just bowling in the rough. Thanks, Arun. I, I think that's really well put. He kind of tried too many things in some ways. He was bowling flatter. He was bowling his variations. Instead of just sticking to the boring old kind of probing, patient offspin that we saw Moin Ali doing so well in, in the fourth innings as well as the second innings. Of the game. So, yes, I mean, I think there was an element of our team selection being slightly wrong. But, guys, do you think that Kohli's captaincy contributed to our loss as well? We've got a, a tweet in from one of our uh, followers on Twitter, and they thought that we should be talking about whether Kohli's captaincy has actually co- uh, cost us this game. Ashwin, maybe we'll hear from you first on that. What did you think of Kohli's captaincy? We obviously had them at uh, 86 for 6 in the first innings and then 122 for 5 effectively in the second innings. Do you think Kohli took the foot off the pedal a little bit? I, I don't know if it's easy to say took his foot off the pedal too much. I don't 
necessarily personally 100% blame Kohli's captaincy for this match. I said before on the show, I blame his captaincy along with Ravi Shastri's management for constantly chopping and changing the side. And we talked a little bit about the team selection. So I think that has a longer term effect on the, the, the side, the squad and the game at large. I don't know if in this game necessarily it stood out. There were, there were instances, you know, like you mentioned after 86 for six, when they got to 110, 115 for six, instead of really doubling down and putting pressure, we said we sort of moved the field back to prevent too many further runs. So there were a few instances of that. Look, I think he's been in, unbelievable as a player. I think his captaincy has been okay, right? Maybe it's not been the best captaincy in the world, but it's been good enough. I think we've lost a lot of this. We lo- we lost this series on the back of our batsmen, and we lost this past match because of our spin bowling. And so I think it's easy to point fingers, and the captain always shoulders the burden, and I think Kohli will, will take his share of the blame for it, but I don't personally think that was the biggest driver. Varun, thoughts on Kohli's captaincy through the series? I mean, you have to also remember we had uh, England 87 for 7 in the second innings at uh, Edgbaston, which was another close test we lost by 30-odd runs. So, Varun, your thoughts on Kohli's captaincy? I, I, I just think an Indian captain doesn't know what to do when the batting and spin department is weak and the <laughs> pace bowling department is strong. I think, historically, none of us not know what to say or do when that seems to be working. So, I, I, I think blaming Kohli's captaincy is a bit harsh. India has always kind of lacked that ability of killer instinct to finish the team off. Like 86 for 6, we should have had them 130 all out. Somebody also said right that if you combine Engl- India's top order and England's lower order, you've got the best test team in the world. So I think it's full credit to the way Butler, Stokes, Curran and Rashid batted. They kind of really stood up and and that's what I think won them the match. I, I don't think Kohli's captaincy needs to be discussed right now. In, in, and more, more because I don't see any other contenders. So this is what we have. The A lot of things are working for us. Kohli himself is working as a batsman. I think there are some tough calls that are needed. For example, the Ashwin call, the continuously playing Dhawan, etc. I think these are some things we need to look at for the future. And, and if Kohli is going to be captain for a long time, I feel like some hard calls need to be taken and, and you need to do it in the view of grooming talent for the future. The only thing I did, forgot to mention that I lied is the, the weak spot of his captaincy is his ability to toss the coin. I think having lost <laughs> yeah. all the tosses in this series may, may not have helped his cows a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. That's such a valid point. I mean, losing the toss is hard, man, when you're playing away tests. It's, it's, as it is... Cricket is one of the only games in the world where the atmosphere, the, the kind of home atmosphere and pitch matters so much. On top of that, you're traveling and then you're losing the toss. I, I think it's very harsh. It's very unlucky also. Okay, I, I think I'd agree with that. I mean, the toss is obviously a crucial factor. But guys, why is India not making it over the line in crucial run chases? We've seen it a number of times growing up in the 90s. It was a one-man show. It was Tendulkar and then there was nothing. And now we're seeing it again and again with Virat Kohli. I mean, we saw it in Adelaide. We've seen it now for a short while. I think it was the Cape Town Test match while he was batting, before we we still had hope while he was batting. We've seen it now at Edgbaston. He made 50-odd in the fourth innings. And we've seen it now in Southampton. So... What? Why are we unable to make it over the line? We've got a horrendous record chasing in the fourth innings. Uh, but, I mean, it just seems to be g- getting worse and worse. So, guys, thoughts on that? Ashwin, maybe you go first. Yeah, look, a couple of thoughts. Okay, uh, Earlier today, I think it was, uh, Ravi Shastri came out and said, hey, 3-1 is not uh, not that bad a result for us because we, we could have actually been 3-1 because the matches were close. Uh, well, I don't actually really like that guy at all, and I don't have a lot of respect for the comments he made. I do I do want to say, I think, in my memory of watching India play test ma- test cricket abroad, the, both the South Africa series and this series have gotten closer than I can remember. Uh, I mean, I really felt we fell 31 runs short at Lord and whatever, 70-something here, 80-something. But I, So I really feel like we were close and almost there. And that's obviously not good enough. But I think it shows there's been progress, and I think Varun mentioned it earlier, right? When you have your fast bowling lineup firing, that's the one piece we've all always looked back and said has been missing for India. Now you've got that, and suddenly or other, you know, usual pillars of strength have become areas of weakness. So I feel pretty good about that in general. Look, we all predicted we would lose the series, 
right? Before the before this started, we all predicted we'd lose it. So to come specifically to your question on why are we not able to get over the line, I think we've made a lot of great progress. I think the one thing that has not clicked for us is the balance of the batting lineup. Okay, when we played Vijay and Pujara with Karthik load on the order. The discussion was we've got too many guys who can grind and we don't have that sort of flair that comes with a Sehwag type batsman or a Dhawan arguably or then Rishabh Pant. We've now brought in Dhawan, we've brought Rishabh Pant as well. And now we, having dropped Vijay, having uh, dropped Karthik as well, we're kind of saying we don't have enough guys who can grind it out and give a tough run chase. So I don't have a good answer for it, honestly, but there's something about just the balance that's missing where, you, you know, World-class test sites find that ability to have the people who can score quickly, then consolidators, and then grinders as well. And we've had, we've a lit- we either have one too many big hitters or one too many grinders, and we're not finding that happy medium. So you're saying that we're competing, but we the teams of old wouldn't even do that, and we they just kind of fall over. And we 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 haven't found our way to win, but we're competing now, which is more than the. All the teams used to do, I guess. Yeah, well, exactly. I'm talking about I, the 90s. We did well in the early 2000s. Yeah, I, I, exactly. And I think if we're able to find that that balance in the top six, I think this is a phenomenal side. But they just haven't been able to find that balance. And that's why there's been so much chopping and changing. Interesting. That that then brings me to our next kind of topic. Are we too dependent on Virat Kohli, Ajinkya Rahane and Cheteshwar Pujara? I think, Varun, you sent a tweet saying the openers of Bhagwan Bharose and then comes then, then come Bhagwan and Bharose and then comes Pujara, Kohli, Rahane and then Tumhare Seva or Koi Nahi Palan Hare makes up the rest of the yes, lineup. I mean, it, it is almost apt, isn't it? Are we getting too dependent on those three batsmen who, I mean, yes, we, we are only playing five specialist batsmen. Three of them who are uh, of of which are Kohli, Rahane, and uh, Pujara, but out of oh, even those three, the only one who scores consistently is Kohli. Uh, Pujara scored uh, a fifty and a hundred, and we'll come to that later. And what a fantastic innings that was! Rahane scored a couple of fifties, but I mean the big runs, the the huge runs that win you Test matches, are not coming. So are we too reliant on the the main man Virat Kohli, the best batsman in the world? Yeah, I think we are, and I think. I think we are too reliant on Kohli. It's not something new as an Indian fan, but I just want to echo what Ashwin is saying, right? We are making progress. I think uh, it's important to realize, and guys, correct me if I'm wrong, but I can't remember the last time any team really played well in a fourth innings to chase down a 250 or a 300. I think the closest I remember is Adelaide, and that too was Kohli. So, team combination has a big part to play. I think the the best team in the world was the Australian team in the end of the 90s, right? Where you had your pace bowlers working, you had your best spinner in the world, you had Hayden opening, Langer consolidating, Ricky Ponting one down, Steve Waugh to follow, Gilchrist who could take the attack apart after you were 300 for five. I mean, that was the best team in my opinion. I don't think teams are chasing scores in the fourth inning. And so I think, like Ashwin said, it comes down to just the factor that how do you support Kohli, Pujara and Rahane with the right team elements? Because very honestly, with Pant, Pandya and Dhawan, I almost see it like those three people together are not even contributing 20 runs to the team. So so something has got to change. And I'm a big I'm a big believer that Pandya has to go out from the test team. I think he's India's best all-rounder, but he's not he's not India's best pacer and he doesn't even feature in that list. Yeah, that actually brings me to Hardik Pandya. What do we do with him? We say that he should be dropped, we should play another batsman. And the next game, he takes five wickets and scores a 50. The game after that, he scores four and zero and bowls in the first innings where we're picking up loads of wickets. He goes for more than a runner ball. And in the second innings, he only comes on to bowl after 65 overs. Kohli obviously didn't even trust him with the ball yeah. uh, to take wickets. So. I think uh, if I, I was checking out on the what latest jobs, I think BCCI has posted a job for director social media strategy. So <laughs> I, I I don't think uh, there's a better candidate for that job than, than the man himself, man. Like, seriously, his Insta game is really at the top, but his test game is probably at the bottom. 
Yeah, I mean, how things have changed since Trent Bridge, where he was, uh, he was the main man, wasn't he? Taking side with and saying, I, "I want to be my own man and whatnot." Yeah, and there's a great Crick Info article, and I, I can't, I can't remember the stats. I'm, I'm very bad with memory of stats, but if you take the Trent Bridge game game out of the equation, mm. his stats look very, very average. They don't look like the stats of a test, a test bowler, or a test batsman. And I think we've just kind of confused this whole situation by 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 giving Pandya the only secure slot in the team between South Africa and England. Rahul has been dropped, Vijay has been dropped, Pujara has been dropped, Dhawan has been dropped, Karthik has been dropped, Pant has been dropped. The only people who have their slots fixed in this team are Kohli and Pandya. That that is a big big issue. Let's let's face that. Yeah. So just for our listeners who. Um... Who, who want to read the Crick Info article? It's a Nagra Jkolapudi article, which uh, says basically India need to be more flexible about when they play Pandya. So that's why you'll see all the stats. You know, it's a great article. So please go and and, and read it. But it's interesting that you brought up Rishabh Pant and Ashwin. Maybe we'll get your thoughts on that. Is Rishabh Pant a long term wicket keeping option for India? Because I saw him keeping to Ashwin on day four, and it worried me about what he's going to do when we go back home. So, Ashwin, your thoughts on on Pant as a a long term wicket keeper for India? Yeah, I, I mean, I've said it said this before. I think it was a harsh call to make a wicket keeper make his debut in England, right? I, and he's he's young. He needs a lot of room. I mean, I remember even watching him in the in the IPL circuit play for Delhi Daredevils, and I and feeling like he's a a batsman who can keep pretty well. So, but but I do think he's the right choice, and I think you know neither Bairstow was a batsman who could keep pretty well, Butler was a batsman who could keep pretty well. So they're not part-time keepers, but they're also not specialist 100% keepers. But Bairstow and Butler both grew into their ability as wicket keepers, and I think Pant can 100% do the same. I think you have to give him a little bit of time. Honestly, I talked about balance a bit before. The issue is you can't, you should never really have four guy, four or five guys in the team who are uncertain and you just got to give them a bit of time. You can maybe at max do that for two to three. But if we think, if you go down that list, I mean, to an extent, Dhawan, we're not really sure about, like like Varun said. But then Rahul, we're saying, okay, even if he's not doing great, we got to give him a bit of time. Pandya, we're saying we got to give him a bit of time because he's new. And now we're saying that for Pant as well. And there's your issue, right? You have to have a solid seven, eight guys and room for maybe one or two younger ones who you want to give opportunities to groom. And here, it honestly seems like we have the solid two guys and eight or nine who are constantly rotating. So I, I, I agree with that, but I do think Pant is the right call from a wicketkeeper standpoint. As much as I like Karthik and think he's earned it, there's no point bringing him back in because it's not a long-term investment. Interesting, because I think my worry with him will be more on turning tracks in India, where from what I saw on day four, he wasn't collecting Ashwin cleanly. And for him to do that on Indian tracks, I think that will be his real test. He's done well against the quick standing back. He's got good reflexes. He moves quickly to the ball. But I think his real his, his real test will come back home. Anyway, guys, I mean, I think we've, we've delved quite a lot on the negative stuff, team selection, falling in the fourth innings, crumbling in the fourth innings, being too dependent on Virat Kohli, not playing Ashwin, etc. What are the positives for Team India coming out of this series and perhaps the Southampton test? Um, I mean, maybe Varun, you can go first on this one. What, what positives can we take out of this tour of England? Yes, we're 3-1 down. We may be 4-1 down at the Oval. I don't know. I mean, that, that would be pretty in some ways unfair in a series where we've been on top for a lot of the time. We've competed a lot. We've had a shot at winning three games. Uh, we've actually won one out of those. So what what other positives you would take away from it, Varun? Yeah, and, and for all our listeners, I think there are a lot of positives. So I think the 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 best part about being an Indian fan today is that we're all angry at this loss, which means that we actually believe this team could win and they have come close. As opposed to the past, where I think um, when we lost, it was more of a when Sachin gets out, turn off the TV kind of moment. So, I think there is a lot of progress. I think for me, a couple of key highlights on the positive. I think Rahul's slip catching was great. India's slip catching in general was better than England. So, that is a good positive. I think Pujara's comeback in this test was just magnificent. I had my doubts about Pujara in the second and third test. 
I think everything went out the window. To balance Kohli and Shastri, you need people like Pujara and Rahane. And they stood up and they did their job. I mean, Pujara single-handedly got us a lead in this test. So Pujara's uh, comeback overseas was magnificent. Kohli scores double the amount of runs as the next highest scorer in the entire series, both across India and England. I think the best part for me is nobody's ever going to question, can Kohli bat in England anymore? I think Rahane has stood up. I think a little bit more needed from him. I'm very happy personally to see Pant because I think that's the right move for India. And then lastly, I think seriously fantastic work from Bumrah and Ishant, man. I was really, really impressed by them. So lots of lot, lots and lots of positives. We just need to build upon this. Ashwin, your thought? No, I think Varun hit the nail on the head. Lots, lots of great stuff. Feeling really good about the bowling and, and some of the batting. And if we can round that out, I feel pretty good about India as, as a test team in the next couple of years. And thoughts about um, Bhuvaneshwar Kumar. I mean, he isn't even part of this team. So, where does he fit in if when he comes back? Say say we had another tour of England in another four years and the personnel remain roughly the same. Who goes out for you guys and who comes in? Or who does he come in for? Because I think Bhuvaneshwar walks into this team, right? Yeah, for me, it comes down to what, what track you're playing on. So, on some of these tracks, I, he would have come in for a Hardik Pandya, play four out-and-out seamers. And have your one spinner. And then, you know, as is, we're basically playing with five batsmen and a keeper. If you're doing that anyway, go Bhuvaneshwar, have four out and out seamers, and back your bowlers to, you know, get England out for even less. Honestly, on most of the other pitches where you want to have that second spin or you decide to play the extra batsman, I think he comes in for uh, Mohammad Shami. And that's unfortunate because he's had good spells in this series, but he hasn't been consistent enough. I think Ishant has earned his spot. He put in his time, worked hard, grew in England. And I think Bumrah, we saw as soon as he came back in, is a game changer. So for me, he comes in for Shami. Interesting. So I, I think the biggest positive for me is that we've competed without Bhuvaneshwar, who would have been a key player for us. I think the disappointment that we're feeling as Indian fans is probably because this wasn't the strongest England team that we could have potentially faced or that we faced in the past. The top order looked a bit wobbly, but I mean, they've compensated with it with their lower order strength, right? Like, Wokes has scored 100, Stokes has got runs, Butler has got runs, Sam Curran, I mean, he's a little demon child, that guy. He Every time he comes out to bat, he scores 50 or, or odd runs and takes the match away from us and t- picks up a crucial wicket or two with the ball. So, uh, what a find that guy is. I think the disappointment for us has really been that this would have been a chance to beat I would say, a subpar English team for a famous win. But it just hasn't happened. We've come close, but as I say, nice try, but no cigar. On that note, there is still one test match left in the series. So, what are your thoughts on the team for the Oval Test match, which starts on Friday? Ashwin, maybe you can go first on this one? Yeah, I honestly don't know too much about the ground. But I'll say, based on how the the pitch looks, I think we would... You would want to go put if you want to go two spinners. I think Pandya misses out, like Varun mentioned earlier. I think you play Jadeja and Ashwin as your two spinners. You keep your your three quicks. Look, Kohli's mentioned this, and there is a difference in it going home with a Test series uh, being one four, having lost one to four, versus being two three. And so I think India is going to be going in for the kill. It's not going to be seen as an opportunity to try out some of the the younger players that have been te- traveling with the squad. I think they'll want to play their best 11. And for me, that's one change, and that's leaving out Pandya for for one for an extra spinner. Or if the pitch is really, really bouncy and the conditions are overcast, then for one, an extra full-time seamer. Baran? Yeah, so I would I would bring Jareja in too. I think he's going to come in place of Ashwin, I, because I think Kohli can't drop Pandya. And what I really, really, really want to see is Shaw making his debut in place of Bhavan. I, I I really hope that Kohli can do that for sure in a no in a in a game that does not have pressure because I think Australian pitches uh, with the tour in December coming up are very different and I think a Shaw can succeed and thrive on those pitches so it's important to hand him his debut tomorrow as opposed to at Perth. That's interesting because I actually have a slightly different view from this. I think there'll be two changes. One because Ashwin isn't to my mind still a hundred percent fit i mean he didn't look he didn't look fit at southampton and there hasn't really been that much time since then so i think jadeja will come in but he'll come in for ashwin 
and i think pandya will go out and vihari will come in because he is the middle order batsman that's got the i think he's got the highest average of any living cricketer first class average of any living cricketer so and why wouldn't he play that guy very, any currently playing cricketer oh any any currently playing cricketer well, correct because he except he karan 50 59 ఇండియా విల్ వెయిట్ టు బ్లడ్ హిమ్ అట్ హోమ్ టు బిట్ ఆఫ్ అ ఛాలెంజ్ అట్ ది ఓవల్ as ashwin rightly pointed out kohli is not going to take this match lightly as a game that's got no pressure you, we saw it at the wanderers in johannesburg he really wanted to win that test match even if they lost the series 2-0 but it had hurt kohli and i think this loss has actually hurt kohli and ashwin i think you mentioned it that you just felt bad for that guy because you could see that india had lost but he'd been defeated <laughs> almost so it was um, i think kohli will want to put his best foot forward and to my mind that is playing jadeja instead of ashwin and bolstering that middle order because the bowling the bowling's all been done by the four bowlers anyway right it hasn't been done by pandya so you may as well let the four bowlers continue with what they're doing and play another batsman and maybe you can get those extra runs to get you across the line so that that's my two bits so the next point is something that came up um i think ashwin you sent a tweet from manjrekar Sanjay Manjrekar the ex India batsman and current commentator was it from 2012 yeah it was from 2012 and he was specifically talking about how he thinks VVS Lakshman should be dropped to bring in Rohit which is one which is one point to talk about but then he said let's give Virat one more test just to be sure he does not belong here and we can reach this just one descendant guys but it's one of those things that you look back on it sounds so absurd that Manjrekar in 2012 was sorry about let's be sure that Virat doesn't belong in the test arena and I mean this guy's got 23 test centuries 6,000 runs just unbelievable that he that something like that would even be tweeted and how many did Manjrekar have did he have four three or good question let me see if I can pull that up while we're talking yeah because the other commentator that I'd like to like talk about a little bit is is our friend Harbhajan the Turbinator who I mean it's if there was ever something that was the opposite of listening pleasure that is what Harbhajan is on Sky commentary it, he it keeps was calling it, Sam Karan Sam Quran like <laughs> the, the the holy book <laughs> he he then decides to call Ben Stokes Ben Strokes and you're just like what is <laughs> what's going on he he's mastered the art of paraphrasing what do you mean right? by that right. So if if Nasir Hussain says the, the like the ball is swinging Harbhajan will basically say the exact same thing in a different way you know yes the ball looks like it is swinging and it's amazing <laughs> he's just paraphrasing the last line of whatever the commentators say i think he's not understanding any of the jokes so sometimes you can see him laughing stupidly and you know he's not understood it There yeah. was some joke about my catheter and somebody else having coffee and Harbhajan was laughing as if you know he's cracked the joke I guarantee you he didn't even understand it No that was a great um, joke actually because my catheter <laughs> was trying to commentate with a coffee cup he picked up the coffee cup instead of the mic so he was trying to speak into yeah. the coffee cup which was a great yeah. moment It it was but if you see Harbhajan's face he has no <laughs> idea what these guys were laughing Okay so uh, so guys has commentary been irreparably damaged by Sanju Manju and Bhajji basically is the, is the question to you is is it never going to make a comeback to the days of jeff boycott and i don't know henry crofield harsha bogle tony greg but you should actually want to listen to I mean, commentary I, on tv richie bano it often happens just from just in our personal experience it often happens that i'll message varun about something silly the commentator said and he'll say oh i i was i don't I have no idea what happened because the match is on but it's on mute and i think i think that's the harsh reality i mean if i can i'll yeah. use this opportunity to plug this great group of guys from england who have been doing some amazing work it's a website and app co- and a radio station called gorilla cricket g u e r i l l a cricket they do independent cricket commentary 
unrelated to the game, but they basically they, they should be live for the fifth test and they do basically anything England is playing in. But really, really good. So much so that I'm often listening to them on uh, the, on audio and then muting the TV and trying to make sure it syncs up. So highly recommended. Okay, awesome. So guys, last question on commentators. Favorite commentator and most hated commentator. Varun, you can't say Danny Morrison. That's off limits. So you have to give us another name. Varun, you go first. <laughs> okay, I genuinely my favorite is Harsha Bogle. I really, really like that guy. And I, I want to see more of him. And the worst commentator for me is El Shiva Ramakrishnan. <laughs> I just I just cannot handle him in those domestic seasons where he just goes on and on and on. Ashwin? I mean, I agree on I agree on both those fronts, but just to be different, I'll say my my favorite one, just for the one moment, is Ian Bishop, and I really don't haven't heard him enough, and I don't think too highly of him. But when he said Carlos Brathwaite, remember the name? It was one of remember the epic, name. It was just one of those epic cricket commentary moments that'll stay with me forever. So that's probably favorite, and then least favorite we've talked about. But I, I have a, diff, a really hard time listening to commentary when my Drakeer is on. Yeah, Manjrekar also gets like trolled on Twitter constantly. Anything he tweets, he just gets trolled. And everyone's like, we need to change the commentary. Sony Max, change this. Anyway, so I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with my favorite commentator currently. Currently, currently. Probably Harsha Vogle. I mean, I would have probably said Ravi Shastri, funnily enough. But our man's just hanging out with Virat in the dressing room these days, just shooting the breeze. And dating a Bollywood actress. Oh, what? Ravi Shastri? Yeah, N- Nimrit Kaur. I mean, I don't what? expect... Ravi Shastri? Is. Yeah. Isn't Ravi Shastri married? With kids and stuff? I, I don't know, but he is dating Nimrit Kaur. The, the lady in Lunchbox and the other Akshay Kumar movie, Airstrike or something. Yeah. Okay, wow. Obviously, I'm not up with the gossip like Varun is. So, guys, that's, um, that's your pitch of gossip for the week. And I think my, my my least favorite commentator, just to be different again, I think it's uh, Sunil Bakwaskar, man. That guy has gone senile completely. He used to be a good commentator at one point. But he just says stuff now. I remember there was a point at which he basically named one New Zealand cricketer and said, oh, no, it's not that guy. But they're all Kiwis. They're all the same. That, I mean, he's just like, what? One, he's just an insane. He's become insane. Anyway, um, so, so moving on to the last segment for the day. Ashwin, I think you've got a quiz for Varun and I. Yeah, I do. I'll try to be quick because we're a little bit over time. You know, obviously, the other big news of the week that we didn't really talk about much yet was Alistair Cook. The man who struggled a little bit this series, but is, you know, England's highest test run scorer ever, has announced his retirement. So, in honor of that, without spending too much more time talking about him, in honor of that, I have a quiz for you guys with all questions about Alistair Cook. The format of this one is that each of you will give me the answer, and whoever's closest gets one point for that question. And then at the end, whoever has more points wins. So, without, without further ado, I'm going to jump right in. Your first question is... We often think of Alistair Cook, the test batsman with 12,000 plus runs. How many T20 international runs does Alistair Cook have in his career? And DJ, you won last time, so we'll start with you. Sorry, there's no toss this year, is it? There's the, no this toss. time? Oh, there's no toss because we're running behind time. So I'm trying to run. Through. That's nice. So T20 internationals? Yes. How many T20 international <sighs> runs? Did he even play any? Uh, I don't know. <sighs> 80. Varun? 80 as in 80? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay, I would say 600. The correct answer is 61. He played four T20s and played <laughs> Shit! <laughs> Dude, who's going to pick him with that T20 team? Are you insane? Have you seen him? Good call. <laughs> he probably played like two games and like scored 30 in each or whatever. Yeah. Nice. Check out my match. 30 in each and then got 80. Wow. Nicely done. I should have said 60 only. That would have been awesome. <laughs> there's, no, there's no bonus point for being close. Okay, second question. Okay. DJ has one point. If you take his test average and subtract his ODI average from it, how much? What, what is that number? What? What is the difference between his test average and his ODI average, basically? 17. 17. I don't know, man. Varun? Uh, 
I'd say 15. 15. Ooh, this one goes to Varun. The correct answer is 8.48. His test average is 44.8. His ODI average was 36.4, and he played his last ODI oh, in wow. December 2014. Okay. So, wow. job. Okay. Nice. Third question. Among all his test runs, he, you know he scored 12,254 runs to date with one test remaining. How, what percent of his runs were scored in England? Uh, let's oh, go with wow. Darren first because he got the last one right. That is what a... percent of runs in England? Uh, 60%. 60 exact? Yeah. Okay. DJ? Uh, I'd say 62%. Ooh. Hey, that's cheap, man. It's cheap, but it doesn't matter because the correct answer is 50.34. So, Varun, oh, yes. he scored 6,169 of his runs in England. So, just a higher than 50%. Okay, question number four. The score is 2 1 to Varun. He started playing Test cricket in 2006. His average of all time, as I mentioned earlier, is 44.89. What is his average in tests in 2018 so far, including the four tests that have happened so far? What is Alistair Cook's test batting average in 2018? Varun, you go first because you won the last question. Um, I would say 20. 20. DJ? 20. It's not going to be much more than that is what I'm saying. I'm not sure how to... Mm. Uh, okay, I'll go with uh, 18. Ooh, I don't know. The right answer is 18.63. So DJ takes Oh, it. yes! Oh, man. Two and tie. <laughs> Not bad. So score awesome. Two, two. All right, let's keep going through. I have two more questions. DJ, you answer this one first because you got the previous one right. How many double okay. centuries has Alistair Cook scored in his test career? Ooh. This is a hard one, actually. I want to say five. I, I'll go with five. Five. Varun? Four. Four. And the correct answer is five. So well played by DJ. Oh, nice. He's smashing. I can't be beaten now. He is yes. On. It's three, two. Yeah, he can't be beaten, but you can maybe catch up and tie. Okay, last question. Where, if you rank all the uh, highest test scorers of all time, what position does Alistair Cook rank? DJ, you go first. Oh, wow. Uh, Twelfth. Uh, Twelve. And Varun, for you? I would say 10th. Ten. 10th. Ten. The correct answer is 6th. So that, Whoa. Yeah. Varun takes that one. It feels like we are now, yeah, we are 3-all three, three all and we have a tie. So I do have oh, wow. a, 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 I do have I a tie breaker. I, yeah. I think for the tie, we should say, how, how do you spell Alistair? <laughs> oh, yeah. We should ask Kevin Peterson <laughs> that. <laughs> Um, okay, so for my tiebreaker question, Alistair Cook has played 289 innings in Test cricket. How many times was he out, caught behind? Oh man! Let's go. This isn't DJ. This isn't Test match. In test match. He played 289 innings. How many times was he out, caught behind? Uh, uh, 289 innings. Caught behind, it's going to be caught behind like by the wicket keeper, not like behind the wicket by slips or caught anything. Wicket keeper. Okay, I'm going to go with 95. Okay, Varun? I'm going to go with 20%. I don't know what 20%. That I have, okay, I'll go with the 75 75 and 90. The correct answer is 77. That is yeah. incredible. So yeah. with that, with that yeah. takes our quiz this week. This is, how, is, how, is, how, is, how is how is 75 20% of 289? <laughs> Sorry. 20%, 20% of 360. And I buffered a little bit because I said you buffered. 77. You buffered. Good. <laughs> yeah, I buffered. The 90s, you buffered. <laughs> he was he was not out sixteen times, but seventy seven is twenty eight percent of his dismissals. His most oh, popular yes. way of getting dismissed is caught. I right. was like, in ten percent of the time he'll be not out. Twenty percent LB, twenty percent bold, twenty percent caught by others, and twenty five percent caught by. And that's not bad. Uh, I mean, just to give you perspective, it was twenty percent 
LB, 12% bold, yeah. 37% caught by others, and 28% caught behind. So not bad at all. Okay, awesome. well done, well done. Great, so that's well it, done. guys. That was our tribute to Alistair Cook in the form of a quiz. We'll, if you guys enjoy the quiz, send us a, a tweet or a message and we'll continue doing it. Guys, thank you very much for listening. We've got lots of responses from you over the week on Twitter. We've got some emails from you. So that's all been really good. It's always nice to hear that there's someone still listening at the other end of this podcast. That's why we do it. We try and do it as regularly as we can, fit it around the rest of our lives. But guys, please keep writing in. Listen to the podcast, subscribe to it, send us a comment, send us a tweet, give us a rating. And I mean, spread the word, tell people around you, tell your friends, tell people at work, tell your family. If your brothers and sisters like cricket, tell them about us, because that's the only way that we will grow. And that's the only way that we, we, we're relying on you to get the word out there. So please, please do. Uh, if you've got feedback, let us know as well. We'd be very happy to take that on. But thank you for listening in again. And uh, we'll see you next week with the next episode of Edges and Sledges. <laughs>